question. It's worth pointing out that this is the first time we offer this tutorial at a LACNIC uh, event. So let me introduce the speakers who are going to explain how we are going to work. So let me invite Massimo Candela, senior software engineer, and Osi Formoso, software engineer for IP, who will be with us via Zoom. So Massimo, can you please join me here? Hello. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Massimo Candela, and this is a tutorial uh, on uh, essentially IP geolocation and how to correct it. On the first part, I will talk about the operational side and how to correct your geolocation in practice, the geolocation that is affecting you and your customers. For example, when you access content. And the second part, my ex colleague and friend Agustin will talk about some updates about what's going on in the field of research on uh, gas in geolocation. Um, so I work for NTT, but this is a tutorial organized by, uh, uh, by LACNIC, so just. Okay, clicker works. Let's start by saying what is the uh, um, IP geolocation. IP geolocation is when you, from an IP address, you want to understand where this IP address is connected in terms of country or city. Uh, and it is something that basically you need on day to day. Uh, when you do uh, uh, in, in networking in general, because uh, uh, you need to know this information to respect country regulation, um, for example, about data locality, to provide localized content, not only a specific language, for example, for a movie, but also a specific type of content for the country where you are serving this data, to optimize latencies like CDNs, to do troubleshooting, for example, uh, network operators have been annotating reverse DNS with uh, geolocation, with country code, and silly code, and YATA code since ages now, so it is something needed. And for research, uh, for example, I have been doing in the past year some research about uh, understanding peering, peering relationships between countries. How do you do that if you do not know which countries? Um, so, but what is the problem? The problem is that uh, the entire IP geolocation uh, field started um, and continued as a, let's say, a self-organized uh, system without coordination and the RIRs, the Regional Internet Registries, um, are not and they don't want to be geolocation providers. Um, so there are third parties data set provided by the real geolocation providers, which are several, I would say many. Uh, and also uh, there are content providers and CDNs that they patch this data. So they use the geolocation provider's data, but after when the, a customer complains, instead of waiting the entire cycle of update from the geolocation provider, they patch their data locally. So sometimes when you have a geolocation issue, especially now that uh, transfers of IP blocks is uh, happening more often. This is uh, more and more geolocation problems. When you have one of these geolocation problems, it is really difficult to understand where the problem is, which data set is the source of that data and how to correct it. There is also no common strategy. Uh, which means that if you read tutorials on how to do that, they tell you, oh, go change this in WIS, change this other thing, try this other thing, send emails. So there is no formula, there is no, it, it's just trial and error. And also, the WIS uh, geolocation information is a total mess. Um, so I would like to spend a minute about this. So, for example, at the moment we have a attribute in WIS that is dedicated to geolocation, which is called geoloc, and this attribute is only supported by RIPE and APNIC, and the other RIRs, they do not support it. 
and I'm happy about that. Uh, so this geolog field allows you to take an entire INN num and provide a latitude and longitude. So basically you're going to use the most accurate and user-unfriendly geolocation format for something wide like an entire INN num. It can be a slash 12. You can geolocate a slash 12 in your living room. And it is uh, not easy, let's say, to use, and uh, if to use it properly, you would have to create a lot of num for all the more, more specific prefixes that you would need. Another attribute that is used is the country attribute, which is supported by LACNIC, RIPE, and APNIC. So three out of five, a bit better than before. However, in APNIC, it means the country where the network is connected. In LACNIC, it means the country of the company that owns the network, which can be a different thing from where the IP is connected, especially for large network. And in RIPE, it's officially described as, or you can use it for or the country of the network, or the country of the company, one of the two, but it is mandatory, which doesn't make absolutely, there is no definition and it is mandatory. So this created a mess overall of how this data is also interpreted. Also, there is a lack of authoritative data, which means that essentially, if you want to change the geolocation of your own IP, these are your own IP, your own resources, you do not essentially have any way to really influence that uh, heavily. Um, so, what usually you have to do is send emails to many organizations. Only Nanog, and I did these slides more than a month ago, uh, only now there are more than this because I saw a few emails in the past weeks. Only Nanog, which is a mailing list, there are 241 emails about geolocation problems since 2019. This is only one of the mailing lists. It's really a recurring problem. So, what do we want? We want an easy way. Uh, to control IP geolocation. Uh, we want to essentially be, this is our, my resource, I want to be able to say where these resources are. Uh, I want a way to be flexible on this. So I don't want to uh, geolocate the entire INNM. I want to geolocate a prefix, but I also want to geolocate an IP. And maybe I want to geolocate a prefix like a slash 12 in a country and a slash 24 inside that slash 12 in a specific city, like for example, this slash 12 is in Italy and this slash 24 inside the slash 12 is in Rome. And I want to be able to essentially create that kind of hierarchy. And I want to be able to specify from country level up to city level, so flexible. And also I want to be easy, easy to maintain, like editing a single file, a text file, okay? Uh, I don't want to send emails and also, uh, you have to remember that in a lot of organizations, uh, who has access to the WHOIS, who has access to Milaknik or the RIR portal, is not the network engineer. So in la medium large organizations, like the one I work, 99.9% .9 of the people, including most of the network engineers, do not have access to the portal. So they will not be able to change their information. They need to edit, the, we need a way to externalize this, for example, on a file that somebody, I mean, once that file is set, the network engineers can just work on that. So the solution proposed and uh, it's RFC 1992, uh, which gives to the network operator the power to control the geolocation of uh, uh, their IP addresses. What it does, it links geofeed file. So the geofeed file is a file that is already used and we will talk about this in a bit and link it from WIS and uh, basically we get from UIS, from WIS the authoritativeness that we need so when you want to look for an IP address information you go on WIS, WIS is already authoritative, it's already the best source to provide uh, uh, the, the needed uh, data authoritativeness that you need. Uh, but we want to don't put the data there because it would not scale, it would not work, we would need to create too many INNMs. Uh, and also we don't have, not every network engineer has access to this, we want just a way to link it once, so we ask our uh, administrator, can you link it? And from that moment on, 
we use our own GeoFeed file. And this allows, uh, this way allows you to essentially have uh, GeoFeed files which are indexed in WHOIS and you can, basically they can be automatically fetched, automatically discovered, but not only that, you have also a way to validate it, which was a thing that validated in terms of ownership, which was a thing that was not happening before. So sometimes, uh, uh, like for example, uh, there were every geolocation provider had his own way to validate for prefix ownership. Like, oh, I check, sometimes I heard, I check the email of the sender of the correction. It, it's, it's not really a, a way to, to, to validate. So this provides an easy way, an automated way to fetch it and also to validate them. So how does it work? You create a CSV file, which is a normal text file, and you create an entry in this format where you essentially have a prefix as a first entry, comma, a country code in ISO, a region code, another ISO code, a city name, UTF-8, normal, comma, and there is an extra space you can put that zip code, but it's discouraged because, I mean, why you want to go in that detail? And after, you put this file somewhere. You host it over HTTPS in a way that people can download it. Uh, and then you go in your RIR portal, like Milaknik, and you add a, you look for the INNAM that contains the, the prefixes that you want to geolocate, and you add uh, this line inside a remark. Geofeed, uppercase G, no other symbol, uppercase G, Geofit space URL, okay? Sometimes I see uh, strange things uh, added, but it's simple like this. No, it has to be in this format. And you put the link to your file. Uh, and that's all, and basically you have done. Uh, now the geolocation provider will automatically fetch it and use it. This is an example of Geofit file. And uh, you can see that basically you have, uh, you can put as many prefixes or IPs you want in the same file. And uh, if you put like, uh, you can put the country code or whatever level of geolocation up to CD. Uh, if you do not put anything, you just put the prefix and you put comma, 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 it means do not geolocate. But it, it doesn't mean that geolocation providers are necessarily going to respect your wishes. So this is the result. So after you add the INNAM, the remark, uh, and you do who is of that resource, uh, you will see this is a resource of uh, uh, entity, the company I work for. But you will see here the remark with the GeoFeed link. And if you see that, and your file contains the data that you need, you have done. Don't forget that you have to put the link in the parent INNAM, the INNAM that contains the prefixes that you want to geolocate. So imagine that you have a file where you put everything in one file, and it's this file here on the right. Okay, you have various prefixes, various IPs. The system works based on the fact that uh, the reader goes in who is, finds the, the INNAM with a remark, follows the remarks and has to accept only the prefixes and IPs that they are inside the remark, okay? Inside the remark, uh, sorry, inside the INNAM. Uh, so if you forget to link it, so for example, if you would add this, pref this IP to the file, but you would forget to find this INNAM and put the link to the file, this IP would not be validated and so it would not be uh, geolocated, okay? Remember that. Now this is a series of useful links. Uh, remember, there is RF, uh, the, ISO, the um, GeoFeed file is a file format that is already supported by all geolocation providers, and it is adopted by year, since years in uh, to exchange geolocation data. But before of this RFC it was done by sending emails or uploading the file somewhere. So you have to respect the standard, which means you have to respect uh, to uh, the ISO codes things. Okay, so, and here you can go on the official website uh, of the ISO.org and you can find the country codes. Here you can find the region codes. 
and here you can find uh, CD names uh, in, a, I would say, standard format. This can help you, but I have a tool that will make it even easier for you. Sometimes uh, looking for the region codes, uh, it's a bit, uh, but please do not invent your own country code. I see there are at the moment more than 5% GeoFe that they are completely based on country code that they clearly do not exist, that they are invented. Um, so, consuming the data. So, there was a question uh, that I received uh, in the past, uh, I think yesterday. I, I just want to go briefly on this. Um, you are mostly, because you are uh, uh, network operators, you are mostly interested in producing this data, so in fixing your geolocation. But I want to briefly and, uh, explain you how the geolocation providers and the content providers can use this data, can fetch this data. So what you do is, is simple. Uh, you essentially take the, you go, you take the WIS data, and the best way to do this is to use WIS dumps, which are files. Uh, and then you find this uh, INN dumps that they have this remark with the geofeed uh, keyword. And then you apply the thing that I was telling you before, where you uh, follow the INN num and you exclude whatever is in the file that is not contained in the range of the INN num that has the link. In this way, you ensure that whatever the file contains is owned by the, uh, the person that uh, added the link. Uh, so there is a hierarchy which is introduced by the INN num itself. So if you, for example, have customers and you give them their own INN num and they link their own file, they can manage their own geolocation. Simple as that. Uh, there is additionally, and this is also to, and here you understand what is, why it is important to have links to single files. There is a, um, a, a basically a digest of the main body of the file, which is, you can do an additional, if you do not trust uh, uh, the authentication of your RIR portal or whatever, there is an extra step that you can do. At the moment, it is not common because. Um, let's say uh, uh, people trust the authentication of the provider of the RIRs, but there is an additional step that you can do where you can sign a single geofeed file uh, with the relevant RPKI certificate uh, covering the prefix. In that case, you will have basically only a specific uh, range inside a single file. But this is an optional thing. So the only thing that you have to do to make it work, the basic step is to create a simple CSV, plain text file, no HTML, no anything, and link it from INNM. Okay, uh, again, don't forget the link. And uh, okay, in practice, the theory about how to fetch it, uh, you can, uh, if you are not interested, you can ignore it. You can go in this uh, GitHub repo, there is an application, GeoFeed Finder. You just run it. You completely ignore the theory about it, and it does produce everything for you. It just does the ownership validation. It manages the cache, uh, both of which of GeoFit files, so that, we, that they, you basically respect the wishes of the various hosts and of uh, don't download too much. Uh, no more than once per day from WIS, and, um, and basically has also the ISO codes and everything validated. This is a command line tool. You run it and just gives you a single big GeoFeed file as an output, a single GeoFeed file that contains all the resources validated for all the single files that uh, were found across all the five RIRs. Now, let's talk about a bit about adoption, because whatever we do, it's uh, fine as long as uh, people, let's say, as long as the solution works and people are using it, okay? If nobody's using it, uh, why wasting time? Uh, who is reading this file? So, there is, I created this web page, uh, which is called geolocatematch.com, which uh, constantly uh, gives you update status on this, uh, the adoption numbers of uh, this RFC. Uh, what that means, at the moment we have, actually yesterday, uh, I uh, discovered that uh, uh, we reached exactly 100,000, 100,000 uh, prefixes, uh, which was uh, strange because it was a perfect number. Anyway, uh, and from like in a month, we jumped from 60,000 to 100,000 of prefixes with geolocation like this. And this is 
uh, internet service provider that they provide their geolocation in this way. But the most important part about this, uh, uh, this website is actually the table that you see here below. So at the moment, if you do this system that I told you, um, most of the, the most important geolocation providers uh, available, they will, in this table, this screenshot is old. We have more geolocation providers that adopted this. They will automatically fetch this data. So you don't have to contact them. You just change your file in your repository or whatever in your tool, and, uh, and they will fetch it automatically. And you have also the, the time here. Uh, most of which is one day. The new, uh, if you go now on the website, you will see that most of these that they were before, four, seven, five days, they are now okay also one day. So in one day you will have your geolocation fixed uh, um, if you follow the RFC. And there is one big geolocation provider uh, that is missing in this table yet, but you have to understand that the biggest part of this work was actually contacting all the geolocation providers and, com and basically explain them, kind of convince them to adopt this solution. But I have to say they have been happy to do so. And uh, so now there is one big one missing. Once after we have this big one, we will have all of them and it would be a complete solution. And this big one that is missing told us well, in the past they told us they were working on it, and now they told us that they will have it soon. They even gave me a specific month, but I want to leave to them uh, the, the public announcement. So soon we will have basically all geolocation providers um, covering this solution, and you will be able to geolocate uh, everything with this. And there is also in that page a way to test your GeoFeed installation, okay? It works across all the five RIRs. So if you are not sure you selected the proper ISO codes and whatever, or you did everything correctly, you just put your prefix here, you click test, and here is going to fetch the INN num, and it's going to uh, tell you which one are the ISO country code and everything. And if everything is fine, you will see everything green. And you can also have a green button here if everything is good that says, hey, tweet about this. So you will say, my organization deployed correctly GeoFeed and whatever. This uh, tweet here, you are going to help us to spread the, the news about this, uh, this system. And, you, if, if, and if more people are using this, better it is because then everybody has to essentially fetch this file instead of inventing data, guessing geolocation. There are files that they say that, so please use it. Um, also, you can find more information on this page. And uh, it, is going to, it goes to explain uh, everything uh, that you may need. And there is also a link to the complete file at the bottom, which gives you the entire, uh, all five RIRs uh, geolocation data already validated. Uh, now, demoing tools. Uh, let's, uh, I want to uh, keep it uh, uh, shorter. I don't want to bother you too much. So uh, I created this utility for GeoFeed files that you can go and uh, it's available on packetvis.com GeoFeed. Uh, well, you can just go on packetvis.com and there is a button uh, called GeoFeed at the top, and, uh, which is uh, here. And this is a wizard. So the thing that I showed you before, where I told you, oh, you can set this country code, you can go in this link, you can go in this other link. You don't need to do that. You just go in this utility. And this guides you towards the entire thing. This is a new, completely new. So it's in beta version at the moment. And if you have any issue, please report it. And uh, the first thing, you add a prefix, then you click next. And then he's going to ask you, okay, where do you want to put this prefix? You can put a prefix or an AP, it's the same. And then you add the country code as a first parameter, then you add the city, and if, and if the city is not ambiguous, then everything is done already. So it, it calculates automatically the region, it shows you in the map so that you are sure that you placed it in the right position. If instead, is not clear, for example, Pasadena. There are like, uh, I don't know, say six or seven Pasadena in the United States. Then he's going to ask you, okay, but which Pasadena, which region? Then you select that and you are done. Uh, it, 
it assures you that the city is inside the region, which is inside the country, and the, all the country codes are correct. So it makes sure that whatever you write is correct. Then it's going to tell you which uh, INET num you have to look for. And uh, now here it says it, everything is fine, but uh, uh, if you didn't set it up yet, it will tell you, oh, look for this INET num and uh, put this remark here, okay? So you can just copy this and uh, there is this file. You don't have to create this file. It's automatically generated by the system and uh, generated the hosted. So you just do what the website tells you to do and everything is going to be okay. So you add this geofeed string, you find this INNUM in your RIR portal, in like in Milaknik. You add this uh, remark link and then you click save and test. And then automatically it will test it for you. This is an example of uh, Milaknik. If you go in the resources after you click remarks, there is a text field like this and then you copy paste what you saw here. So you copy paste this and you put it here. Then you do save and test and sorry, if you do save and test, it will give you this thing at the bottom green. If you receive that thing at the bottom green, it says everything is fine. Then your geolocation is going to be, it's, the setup is complete. You did everything correctly, everything is fine. If you do not want to have this file automatically generated by this uh, tool and automatically generated and hosted, you can say host by and you say myself. Then if you say host by myself, you can essentially download this file and host it wherever you want or you can create basically copy by hand. Uh, if you click, it will show you which uh, is the content of the file. So you can copy by hand and host it wherever you want. You don't need to necessarily, but this is just uh, extremely convenient. Uh, test and host it for you. Now, everything is done. There is one extra step that is optional if you want to do it, which is this large link there. Check where geolocation provider say it is. Which brings you to this page. What this tool does, it goes across all the geolocation providers, uh, including uh, big providers like MaxMind, IPinfo, and others. And uh, it fetches the geolocation that they see and it compares it to the geolocation that you said that you want it to have. If the geolocation is fine, like in case of Pasadena, you will see a green check that says, oh, it's good. And it also tells you how they are going to fetch the information that you put. There is automatic and there is manual, okay? If you do it automatic, uh, so if you do it, you don't have to do anything. So if, if you see that it's automatic, it means that at some point, probably is going to be uh, green here and nothing has to be done. If instead you see manual, it means that uh, they do not support yet uh, the automatic uh, geolocation uh, system that I described before in the RFC 1992. However, we will send them automatically an email because you click this link and we say, hey, look, you have to update this geolocation. We will send an email to all the one uh, that they don't have this automatic system in place. Uh, we, we send this email batch. Uh, so basically, we, 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 we do this for you as an intermediary, and, uh, uh, but you can uh, refresh this page in the coming days to see when the geolocation provider uh, uh, sync. But this is an optional step. Up to here is the only thing that you need really to do, and you can do it with this tool or with whatever tool you want. Uh, uh, this part you can uh, uh, just uh, um, just stop here and and, uh, and be happy with that. So I would like to just uh, now. I think we are going to just conclude here. And um, so Geofeed linked from Huis is the only solution that allows uh, you to update automatically your geolocation. There is basically no other solution at the moment that allows you to do uh, anything really similar and especially there is no other solution that works across the five RIRs. 
and it's the only, of course, it's the only one working with five RIRs and, and it's the only one working in an automatic way. And uh, after uh, like uh, some more, one year and a half, more or less, we managed to have almost all geolocation providers on board already. We are in contact with content providers as well. So uh, the content providers, by the way, they use the geolocation providers as well. But some content providers, um, they um, also express the wish to uh, use this, fa this system to basically fetch, update the geolocation faster and independently. Um, so there is the first link here that you can uh, uh, that you can uh, click is the, the the tool that helps you with a wizard to do your installation. If you need uh, that, is going to be extremely helpful. The second link is the one that gives you number about the adoption and allows you to do a test. So if you use the the wizard on the first step, that also tests for you. So you don't need to test it with the second wizard. But if you do it manually, then you can use the second page to do the test, the adoption number, and also all information about the RFC. And the last link is the link of the RFC itself, if you want to uh, read all the details. Now, my presentation is over, and um, bef I don't know if before to pass the uh, uh, mic, to, since we have a good amount of time, before to pass the mic to Agustin, if you have question, I don't know if we can get question now and see. Okay, if you have any questions, uh, please do question. Also in, in, in Espanol, but slow, and it, I can answer you. Okay, not all together, please. Massimo. Hey, Agustin. There are some questions in the chat. Ah. By yeah. Hugo Salgado. Do you want me to read them out loud? Uh, is there any way in 1992, so in the RFC, to handle any cast technology with geolocation? I understand that there is research using different measurement points to try to detect if an IP is any cast, and it is a hard problem. But perhaps a standard could be developed so that organizations that want to voluntarily mark IP as any cast can do it. So I... That's his first question. Okay, so I go with the first. I. I... The audio was not completely clear, but I think I got the question. So the first part of the question if, is how RFC 1992 handles Anycast. And the answer is it doesn't. Because Anycast is, uh, so the, 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 the goal of the RFC is to correct the geolocation and allow operators to correct the geolocation uh, of their um, IPs and it's essentially mostly targeted to, um, for example, uh, the users that they connect to streaming and they, oh, I cannot, it doesn't work because it says that I'm in another country. And Anycast is more related to, I would say, like, I don't know, uh, infrastructure kind of uh, uh, endpoints which are not the target of the RFC. And uh, if you have, and also they are not the target of the geolocation provider itself. So when you go on uh, uh, the geolocation provider uh, website and you put Anycast, the, the, the geolocation provider has to give you a geolocation. So it can tell you that it's Anycast. They may have other APIs for you to fetch uh, the various uh, endpoints, but that's not the goal of the type of geolocation that we are doing here. This is the goal of, oh, I want to correct the geolocation of a user that is connected. So Anycast is not part of that, and it's not part of that both in the RFC and on the, um, on the geoloc geolocation provider side. So it, 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 I would say it's not really related to, um, to what we are trying to do here. There are research projects, and this is the second part of the, of the question. And there are also that they try to uh, detect Anycast and uh, with latencies and stuff, but I think you can probably answer to this later better. 
Um, yeah. And, uh, and there are also geolocation providers that they are offering this type of detection as a service, but it's not really, it, it's like a proxy detection, it's like uh, when they do VPN detection, it, it's, it's an extra service compared to the IP to geolocation kind of uh, activity. Did I answer your question? I cannot hear you. I think you're Another muted. question. Uh, can we assume that the mentions of who is also work with RDAP? I ask because ICANN has finally officially deprecated who is for domain names, so it is expected that in the coming months or years it will begin to disappear. For this reason, I think it would be important to focus on RDAP, especially since it was precisely in the RIRs that this technology was born as a replacement of WHOIS. Yeah, okay. Um, this is a good comment, and um, I think uh, there is here a, a use of uh, terminology that I did to simplify the concept here. When I said WHOIS, I do not mean who is like the protocol to access the data, but the data set itself, which is a common way to define the data set. It doesn't, so at the moment, you can use also, I mean, if you go on um, um, Geofit Finder, the tool, it uses who is dumps for four RIRs and RDAP for one, which is RN of the RIR. We can move to have all of this on RDAP, but it would be a really uh, not smart, uh, uh, as, a smart way to do. What I mean is that all the five RIRs, they essentially provide who is dumps, which are single files. So independently of the technology to access it, so even if we move everybody to RDAP and, and the client application of WIS will use RDAP, the WIS dumps are going to be there. And, uh, and that is what already geolocation provider use. And they are just text files and uh, they are convenient, they are uh, lightweight, we don't have to do multiple queries. So RDAP remains really useful when you want to just find the geofeed of one prefix and then you want to, for example, do a test on fly like I do in the website. But for the global fetching, it's much better to use the WIS dumps, which are essentially just RIR database dumps on files. I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Answered. Perfect. Do you have other questions? Okay, then I think, uh, Agustin, the stage is uh, yours, at least the virtual one. I'm going to put the mic here. Thank you very much. I think you need to authorize me to share my screen. Could you please allow me to share my screen, please? Danos unos segundos. Just a couple of seconds, Agustin. We're almost there. Ahora sí, ya podemos ver también tu pantalla. Adelante. There we are, we can see your screen. 
Thank you, Massimo, for your presentation. This, that was a great presentation. And it is important to standardize things and to land all the protocols and implementations. I'm Agustin Formoso. I work for RIPE NCC as a senior software engineer. One of my roles is that I um, I work and assist to the researchers and investigators, so I am in contact with major data sets, tools. And the intention today is to tell you about the services we have, one of the services which is called IT Map. And although this IP map is generated from the investigation world, the research world, it contains several practical things that you as operators can take home and will also help you visualize and understand the large data sets we have based on geolocation. Now, one of the things that I want to clearly state is that when we speak about the core of the Internet, we are speaking about transit providers and IXPs. And this is what IPMAP is focused on. I will start by defining what IP map is to understand where it is born and the type of information you can find in this platform. After that, we will look into the details as to how IP map works inside. There's a constant that is that of the engines. This is a geolocation engine. IP map some a couple of these inside. I'll show you what these are and how they work. Then how IP map is related to IP to RIP I plus. And then how you can use IP map to consult the information you have through the different interfaces. And finally, an overview of the next steps we have planned for the roadmap. This is not the first time we speak about IP map at a LACNIC event. Massimo, a couple of years ago, gave us a webinar on geolocation, and this also included issues related to IP map. This was also presented at LACNIC 29 a couple of years ago. So these are the most recent instances that I could find. It is likely that there are some others in an update update of RIPE and CC. So if you have further information, you have historical data that can be added to this presentation. So we start with what is RIPE IP map. This was born in the world of investigation of research. Back in 2012 and 2013, we worked on the work was done on the first prototype. This is a more advanced prototype, the one Massimo was working on, and we're also working on one now. Now, this can be viewed as a database with geographical IP addresses on I geographical locations. Geographical, um, sorry, Massimo explained us what a geographical location is. It's not latitude and longitude, but this could be a city, a town, a country. So each has its own ID and its own name. So those are the types of things that you can include in the geofeed that Massimo was telling us about. Now, when the project was originated, this was called Open IP Map. This was the original name it received, but then we had to change the name. For those of you who know OpenStreetMap will understand the rationale of crowdsourcing behind this. There is a community where you have experts on the topic. I am aware of my internet environment and I wish to contribute expert information. So this was inspired on that name, but we had to change it for different, for several reasons. Now, the definition of what this service is, I repeat, this is the core of the internet, namely the IXPs that provide transit and routers. So there are studies to determine the precision of the IP maps compared to other geolocation providers. 
And when we speak about the internet, IP map is more precise than others. There are studies, Massimo was also involved in some of these, but we took samples from other platforms for measuring these. In a study we saw this, but we haven't seen is geolocation of end users. In other words, we're not, we don't want to locate last mile users, but this is a user case and one of the drivers of the project. We want to identify trace routes in the map. This is normally full of errors, so what we want to do is to visually, with a very simple overview, show the trace routes which go to different destinations and there are n number of hops. And the typical questions that we ask this is those trace routes that are originated in a country and this destination is in the same country. Some originate and leave the continent. What countries do these go through? So these are the types of answers that we look for. So whenever we want to solve suboptimal uh, operations, these are solutions that we're trying to figure out. An IP map seeks to work on solutions such as this and to have results of adequate quality to respond to these questions. The two maps show trace routes originated in Mexico with destination IPs within Mexico. You can see in the map on the top that there are trace routes that go all over North America. So there are circuits that leave the country. So we always try to improve internal routing so that these things don't occur. And in the map on the bottom shows they cross the ocean, they go to Europe and they come back. The circuit is a bit longer. And this is one of the applications we have, which is called JEDI, uses the IP map data to produce visualizations such as this. These are examples of Mexico for IPv4. This is also available for IPv6. But the thing with IPv6 is that there are less hops, so this is not as dramatic. But I wanted to highlight this point of these routes. So this is the link in JEDI March 2023. This is the last time we ran the JEDI. This was done on the first of the month, visually for all the countries. So if you click on the link, you can check this out. So what the JEDI does is to try to figure out solutions for problems such as these. Now, if we go over to the service itself, if you go to ipmap.ripe.net, this could be an excellent moment to do so. Those of you who have your laptops there, you can check this site. You will find documentation there. But above all, there is something that I would like to highlight. The landing page shows a console where you will be able to paste a, tra paste a trace route in the command line. You can enter a trace route with all the hops. This is one that I launched from my laptop towards an IP of LACNIC. And what this does is to try and demonstrate what IP map knows about the IP addresses, intermediate IP addresses. Now, this is not the product itself. This is just a way of demonstrating the things we can do. So you have a console, you launch a trace route, you paste it here, and then you can visually and very simply see the information available on those IPs. Now, you can always click on the intermediate hops and this will take you to check the results of the API and establish the relationships between the IP address and the geolocation information. Now, 
you can therefore check ipmap.ripe.net. You paste a trace route and you check what the IP map knows about that trace route. Now, how does this work with the geolocation engines? So they work with geolocation engines. These are algorithms that have entries and outputs. And there are some properties in between that allow you to estimate the location of a given address. So there are different types with different levels of precision. We have the latency-based engines. The first one is called latency. The other one is called single radius. Then we have the DNS-based engines, which are based on the PTR red codes. This one is called reverse DNS. So it looks at the rows and tries to guess this. I will expand on each of these later on. Then we have the community-based engines. I said initially IP map was strongly based on what the different experts knew about the network. Then we have the Anycast and the IXPs. The information I will be giving you, at least the majority of the information as to how the IP map works, is also available in the documentation section, ipmap.ripe.net.docs. This is available in English but can be easily translated into any language. I recommend those who are more techies to go and read all the details as to how these things work. So I was telling you about the engines, for example, the single radius engines. So in uh, the categorization, you can do it with active or uh, passive uh, messages. This is uh, generated. This generates measurements of ripe atlas. In particular, this generates pings between the IP address from which I want to get the location and we have to think of a center and radius. So the center is the probe of a ripe atlas and the radius is uh, uh, proportional to the measurement, the measurement of the latency. Basically, the closer I am to the IP address, the closer I am in geographical terms. I'm going to give you further details later, but in general terms, that is the concept. Considerations, well, that this has to do with uh, the speed of light. Basically, we take a constant that is C, the speed of light, and uh, to, we count two, ter two thirds of the RC, and it and uh, the system applies this, the, the the motor applies the same size of the, the earth and probably it's not very uh, precise but it changes depending on the density of probes uh, from which I get measurements. We're going to see that later on and usually anything over. 10 seconds is too close. The, the closer, the better, and the more precise. The furthest in terms of RTT, less the, the least the precision, and we can say, and after a thousand milliseconds, we don't even consider the result is valid for, to, for the estimation of geolocation. And an important issue is uh, the definition in cities. The l cities are located. We're, we're going to see how the 
Mauta uh, develops a ranking of the cities and remains with the top 100 or the top uh, 10 cities of the predefined cities. So, just as an example, and we speak, still speak of general issues, not details yet. So, this is center and radios, for instance. Let's imagine. I'm sorry, but uh, there are many silences. These are the more heavily populated uh, centers with over 10,000 people. Let's imagine that I want to locate a certain IP address. What the mode uh, does is of all these uh, uh, places, um, it's going to start measuring the probe and, uh, and the other one. There is a radio, a radius of uh, 10 milliseconds. That's the maximum. So the estimation will make the IP address to fall inside that radius. So as I was telling you, the furthest, the worse, and the closer, the better. So this gives us an overview of how this works, how you can measure latency of the probe toward the IP address and to be able to estimate the city where the IP is located. So, going, uh, getting into more details, the motor does not uh, choose a probe, but a set of probes, and basically it makes an attempt to optimize the measurements. These measurements are not free of charge. Usually each measurement costs, has a time cost and has a cost for using the system and uh, storage. There's a popular myth that storage is cheap. It's nothing but, and it's very easy to make uh, too many measurements to be able to guess the place. So it puts together two lists based on one is an ASN list and the other one is cities. And it looks for different sources of data. One is uh, the rib of uh, RIBE and the other is Atlas. So to put together the list, first it looks for the ASN, then it adds the neighbors of the AS ASN IP, and it does it with RISP, then peering um, to find the members if it's And then it looks for the ASN facilities. These should be only ASN facilities. Just as members looks for the facilities where the ASN is connected in appearing. It is important for each operator to update the data in peering DB so that this will start operating with more precisely. And you have a list of cities. It puts the city where the probe is of that ASN. Then we get the ASN. You have to read it inside out. The same things happens with the city of the IXP and the facilities based on the ping. Then to select the probes, it takes the probes of the ASN of the IP address. This goes to 100, then uh, 10 random probes in the list, and it takes 50 probes uh, of uh, the cities. And if it is unable to find the ASN IP, or if the topology is not consistent, then it it has a ranking of cities with an, of an essential absolute maximum. Each city, it knows the distance of the probe and it adds a weight 
and it is here that we get the 10 milliseconds. 10 minus RTT. If RTT equals 10, this weight will be zero. I think that they turned the camera off. Can you hear me well? Hello, Austin. Yes, we we don't uh, hear you well. Maybe it's your connection. Maybe you can turn off your camera so we we'll see whether we can improve your uh, voice. Can you hear me better? Yes, we can hear you better. I don't know where we had stopped, but I, I was telling you of the citizens' rankings. Of all the definitions of cities that we have, we're going to arrange them based on those three components, distance, facilities, and population. So here, each we know uh, how far each city is uh, from the probes, and we have the RTT because we are results of measurements. So for those RTT equal to 10, that weight, that coefficient will equal zero. That is, everything that has RTT or more will work. So we have the distances, the RTT, and and then this is important. I put that's why I put an asterisk. Is the definition uh, based on the uh, uh, core of the internet? This emphasizes the core. What the ranking does is to count the number of facilities by appearing I uh, DB. And then we can also consider the population, and based on that ranking, we determine the candidate city to host the IP of destination that you want to locate. So that is the algorithm as it works. Let me tell you that this sensor measurements of IP are IP atlas, these uh, that are known, these are the pings, and this is the way you see it in the map for an IP address. You may notice where it's going to be. There were many probes selected in the map. There are probes that have a higher latency and others have a lesser latency. And as I said, the closer the better. It's more likely for this probe to be in Uruguay. This in particular is one of the IPs of LACNIC. And what you can see in the box is this is nothing but a measurement of RIPE Atlas that requested 295 probes and the various probes uh, answered with different RTDs. So you see there's a tag that is, says single radius and a, another tag that says geolocation. The good thing is that uh, all those who collaborated uh, to the results, you can find here. I leave the link, the measurement of RIPE Atlas that you see on the screen. Then we'll go to another motor. This uh, is called motor latency. So contrary to what happens to a motor of active measurements, it requests Atlas to make a measurement to geolocate a certain IP address. So what motor latency does is to take all the trace routes existing in the Atlas platform of the last week, and it's quite uh, quite a few, millions of them, taking the individual hops and taking them as if they had been geolocation measurements. That is, hops that originate in a probe. And if we look at the right, the hops for each intermediate hop, I take it as a different geolocation measurement. All the measurements, this generates a, a lot of information, and we can have more estimations about the latency. 
what the motor does, in addition to passively reading and analyzing all uh, the results of Atlas, is trying to improve the precision of the so-called anchors and probes. What it does with anchors first is through measurements on anchors only, try to estimate which anchors may have incorrect geolocation information. And then once you have a subset of anchors with a better quality data, we measure from the probes to the anchors trying to validate the geolocation data of the probe. And that gives us a subset of uh, probes uh, and anchors that have geolocation information. And another thing this does, and this is somewhat related with one of the questions of Hugo of any cast, this is also an attempt to see whether based on latency, we can find some bubbles of latency together for the same IP address and being able to consider it as any cast. So if this motor finds those latency bubbles for the same IP address, it will suggest it to the motor. It may say, well, this may be an IP address. So that is, those are basically the two latency-based uh, motors. What I'm going to do now is to give a step aside and to quit speak talking about IT mat motors, but I'm going to try to start talking about the same data set. And uh, thanks to the one that, we, that thanks to the fact that we are using systems like BigQuery, we can analyze the entire data set very easily, and we can generate this data for similar purposes. When we talk of min RTT, that's precisely what it means. It takes the RTT of the three routes of all the Atlas uh, probes to all the IP addresses. And each, uh, for a new result, we uh, look for the ASN that is generating that. So we have um, ASN-based uh, um, detectors. So what, for each hop, we are aggregating by day. And as we have the different ASNs, we can start begin to understand for instance to cluster all these measurements if based on ASN1 for instance so this set of data will give us very good information about the minimum RTTs of all the ripe atlas uh, probes so for instance if i want AS1 i can uh, s search through AS1 to understand how it is that all the Atlas probes see it. Let me show you a map where we put the uh, probes in hexagonous and hexagon, and we can ask uh, what are the Atlas uh, probes that are within 100 milliseconds of my network. We can look for XP. But we can start having visualizations of this kind. I was telling you each hexagon contains one or more probes. The colors are green for low latency, red for high latency. And we can start with a simple example here, one of RIPE NCC. It operates in some place in Holland. We see that the probes near Holland have this latency. So let's check, but with simple validations. And what other networks can we see? We can see RIPE NCC, but in best sites. You will see that they are very similar. I will go back to V4 and V6 so that you can view the difference. This is V4 and this has more probes and this is V6 which has less probes, but the results are very similar. I est established the threshold between green and red at 100 milliseconds. So what you see in green and orange is below 100 milliseconds. 
then something that is of a more local nature. This here, I looked up the more popular ASNs in Mexico, for example. This is an ENET. If we see Mexico 8151, we see a lot of things in green in Mexico. There's quite a lot in orange in the United States. And the good thing is that because we can view the entire coverage of RIPE Atlas, we can see at some of the specific cases. Now, specifically, if you look towards Europe and you focus on Russia, there is a green point. And I started to figure out or ask what that green point could be, and there were two possible explanations. There could be a probe in Russia, or the geolocation of that probe is wrong, and physically it's located in Mexico, but the geographical information in Atlas is found in Russia. So these are the visual tools that allow us to drill down the data on that probe. And what I found was the following. I started to look at the results, the latency results for that probe, that green point in Russia, and I checked the different networks. So in the x-axis, we have all the ASNs to which that probe did measurements. And on the y-axis, we have the latency measurements. What we see is that the, so, the probe in one millisecond measured a large number of international networks and carriers like Google App, uh, Wikimedia, and what started to be suspicious. I'm going to leave the link. You can see the link here at the bottom so you can sort of play around with these visualizations. And this will be very easy. You just need to have a browser and clicking and searching, you can inspect the information in a very easy way. So we start seeing the ranking and which are the probes that are more, are more distant places. We start to see things such as these. So that line, which was a millisecond, is now very close to the x-axis. So these are 220 networks that this probe is viewing at a second, a distance of one second. Now, as from the 220 networks, the latency then changes. Now, what does this mean? It might seem as if the operator of that probe, of that ASN, or some kind of upstream, is editing the responses that are appearing so rapidly. So the original measurements that went towards some of the cameras who are being intercepted and responded much earlier at a value of less than one millisecond. But I wanted to show this as a very simple case to see what specific problems could be or geolocation problems through these types of visualizations that bring together the, the set of data in RIPE Atlas. This same exercise was done for other networks, for Total Play, for example. Very similar results, Mexico in green, the others in the orange range, and also for Mega Cable. You can also enter your own ASN or IXP in Peering DB. This over here is IX26. This is M6. And similar to RIPE NZC, quite green in Holland and red in the rest of the planet. So you go over to visualization and check that, and then let us know what you think about this. Now, speaking about latency and how this relates to errors. In this context, I wanted to mention the work that Massimo has been doing for the past three to four years. And one of the conclusions, one of the main conclusions, is that the error induced by latency measurements, this is in proportion to the type of coverage that the probes have and the coverage of the probes. So Europe is full of probes. The 
error is lesser. In South America, there are less probes, and there are areas where there are more errors. So as I was saying, light speed and propagation speed, so these things have to be taken into account in order to determine the precision of the results because of the number of probes. So speaking about coverage, I wanted to convey this message. We always check the Atlas uh, ripe atlas coverage in the countries where we make presentations. In my opinion, Mexico has a great coverage. In this pie chart, you see that for all the operators in Mexico, the pie share represents the number of users that that operator has in Mexico. What we can see is that more than 75% of the operators that cover users at least have one Atlas probe. Then we have that remaining 25% of smaller ASNs. So this is what I would like to tackle as next steps. So I'm going to leave you the list of smaller ASNs here on this table. So if you are operators of one of those networks, or you, if you know one of the operators of those networks, we have Michaela who is in the conference, we have Marco who is present at the conference, and I encourage you to speak with them so that you get a physical probe if they have any left, and otherwise you give them your contact details so they will send you a RIPE Atlas probe. So if we zoom outwards, this is RIPE Atlas coverage in the entire LAC region, country and operator, depending on the number of covered users. Here you have the ASN numbers, which are quite a lot, but these are the most important ASNs that don't have a probe, and we would like them to have a probe. So if you feel identified, or if you know anyone who operates these networks, this is the same message. Michaela and Marco are at the conference, and you can apply for a probe online, but because you have the experts in the conference room, I encourage you to address them. Now, going back to the IP map motors, there is one that has to do with DNS. So basically what we do here is to look up the PTR records of all the hops in RIPE Atlas. So each hop produces an IP address. That IP address has a reverse. And we look at these reverse DNSs and give these as input to another subsystem called Hoiho. This is holistic orthography of internet hostname observations. So the idea is to try and identify and guess where these are. And you have examples from one to four from with higher to lower precision. There might be patterns that are repeated through hostnet that have AMS01. That will be in Amsterdam. And if it is a new one, it's router two with AMS01, I know that will be located in Amsterdam. And the same thing happens with other types of patterns. Each engine in IPMAP has a score, a precision score, and we base ourselves on things such as this. For example, Hoiho has a score which is good, which is better than a promising score. So we look, therefore, at this when we check the results of the IP maps. And to start wrapping up, the last motor I wanted to refer to is that of crowdsourcing and how the keynote was originated originally with a strong focus in the community. We know there are experts, we know that there are people who know a lot about where the trace route might be going or to learn about trace routes where the DNS cannot produce a good response. So we started launching this development phase internally, namely how our analysts, which are the power users, how they could start to generate several results with a high reliability. So in this case, an analyst can 
generate end results of geolocation based on what the analysts know. So the idea is to have more roles with different levels of access, but initially we're trying to test it out internally before releasing something to the public. So I still have to explain how to use IP map. There is an API. This is the URL. And this on the right is a format of the responses. We invite you to explore this. And also, and not less important, are results in FTP. RIPE's FTP contains a lot of information. This was repeated for Mexico. This is yesterday. There are quite a number of records in the IP map for Mexico. Look up this file, look at the data, and you have APIs to find this. So we covered quite a number of concepts. And sort of to recap, we saw what IP map is. We focused on the core of the internet. We saw the engines and how they work. We looked at crowdsourcing and how all this is related to ripe atlas measurements. It's important to do measurements and to have coverage. We, I showed you the APIs and the files and how to use these. And I also shared with you the latency and the main RTT. So you can start checking these out these data sets that are based on all the information available in RIPE Atlas. So I think this is quite a powerful summary of information that can be useful for you when you want to have an overview of geolocation. So with that, that would be the end of my presentation. I don't know how good or how bad the audio was, but we can now open the Q&A session. We can open the Q&A session now. Yes, so I just, wanted to say something and Guillermo here with me will uh, help me with the, with the translation as well. The system you saw before during my presentation is a system to correct your geolocation, the geolocation of your customers. It's a system for network operators to fix geolocation problems with streaming platforms, and all content providers that will put your IP in the wrong country and you cannot access. That is RFC 1992. The presentation of Agustin about IP map is a system, a research project to guess, calculate the geolocation of IP addresses based on lat latencies for infrastructure. So two different things. One is operational, the other is research, so that you know um, uh, what you need to use when you, uh, uh, when you want to correct your geolocation at the moment. Um, well, what Massimo said, for those that are not listening to translation, basically, is that the difference between the two systems that were presented, first of all, the first is for network operators that want to put the geolocation information of the data of their clients. And the second one is more uh, related to geolocation of IPs, and this has to do more with the research. Thank you. Okay, so now we have a space for questions, and we have them via Zoom, and here, if you wanted to um, uh, ask anything, you can come to the mic. So we have a, a question here in the room. Please say who you are and the organization you represent. I'm Nacho Matilde of Ita Broker. 
uh, my customers can <laughs> give you uh, your help. Mis clientes aceptarán. My customers will be very great, are very grateful for the work that Agustin and you are saying, and not just Massimo, Agustin too. Thank you. It's a spectacular job that you're doing, and it's really very helpful for the community because really there are many problems like this. We are doing, we, we work with this um, every day, and it is terrible. How, to see how sometimes they fail to uh, access uh, the services. It was nice to, to, to get feedback when the system works. Thank you. Bien, tenemos alguna pregunta. Ah. Do we have any questions? We have a question for Agustin in the chat. Agustin, would you like to take a look at it? It's available there. It says the deployment of uh, probes and anchors among network operators could help improve uh, the metrics of the service. Can you uh, develop it? it uh, to uh, develop IP map and the rest of useful tools, especially for the region of uh, lack. The first question, yes, that will uh, improve uh, the quality of the results. The more uh, probes and the more anchors, the better. We are far from saturating the LACNIC region, especially the, the areas in yellow in the map. It would be good to have a better coverage. And the second, about using the app in the LACNIC uh, region, I don't find the question. Could you repeat it, Chicho? Yes, the second says, can you develop in, in uh, the app map and the rest uh, of the useful tools, especially for Latin America and the Caribbean region? Well, the app, yes, you can develop it. It's open. It, it's open to uh, um, uh, anybody who wants to use it, and it's open for any kind of development. There's another one by Luis Daniel Uturbide Ramirez. What are the geofeeds you recommend, and which is the best for an adequate geolocation in a short time? I think that's for Massimo. Yes. The geofeed is your geofeed. So there is not a what the best GFID. You just create your own and you put it in uh, who is, and, uh, and it will be fixed most of the time in one day. In one day, the geolocation providers will fetch your GFID. But the GFID is a file, it's a CSV file. So there is there is not a better the best GFID. Or it's just your file. You create your file, you put it somewhere. You link in WIS, and in one day, most of the geolocation providers will update their geolocation. And so the content providers and so on. The content providers maybe a few days later. Bien. Bien, vamos a finalizar entonces. Muchas gracias, Agustín. Muchas gracias, Máximo. Ahora los invito a hacer una pausa larga. Thank you. We are now going to have a lunch break. We'll meet again in one hour.